The 17th of March is St Patrick's Day. And we're not forgetting that here on The Good Life on ABC Radio with me, Nolda Bean. Well, St Patrick is, for practical spirituality, certainly for English speakers, possibly the most famous of all saints, certainly among Catholic English speakers. Few saints have had quite so much personal influence or practical fame. Maybe St. Paul knocks him or the Apostles, but he's right up there with the most famous of Christian saints. In the 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th century, Irish Catholics escaping poverty settled all over the world and they took their saint and his shamrock with them wherever they went. America, Australia, Europe, they're all over the place. Here in Australia, the Irish missionaries also established an order of religious men, the Patrician Brothers, or Brothers of St. Patrick. The Brothers of St. Patrick were instrumental during the 19th century in reinvigorating Catholicism in Ireland. They worked tirelessly, along with the, uh, the sisters who were sort of allied to them and from the same founder, the Brigidines, or the Sisters of St. Bridget, to improve literacy among the oppressed Irish poor under British penal law. Well, those Patrician Brothers settled in New South Wales in Australia. They're known particularly in that state for their schools and for their considerable influence in education. Well, St. Patrick is their patron. The 17th of March is the Feast of St. Patrick. And the teaching and spirituality of St. Patrick is foundational to the practical spirituality of Patrician Brothers. My name is Brother Paul O'Keefe and I am a patrician brother and have been so for 40 years now. Presently I am what we would call the Deputy Congregation Leader, that is the second in charge of our congregation worldwide. Now I saw the way you naturally went to grab that mic then, I think you might have been a teacher once. <laughs> I was, I certainly was. I've, most of my ministry has been in education. I have taught in uh, Sydney, far north of Queensland, on Thursday Island and uh, in Papua New Guinea as a teacher as well. Patrician, it's named after Patrick, which is a sort of the key to today. What do you know about Patrick? Well, Patrick is our patron. He was chosen by Bishop Daniel Delaney, our founder, and we were given that name, Patrician Brothers, more formally, Brothers of St. Patrick. Patrick was an extraordinary sort of a fellow in many, many ways. He was a great missionary, there's no doubt about that. He was a thinker. He was a challenger. He was very much embedded in the gospel. And he taught, and taught very, very simply. Everybody knows the three-leaf clover or the shamrock. And uh, that was Patrick's way of trying to explain to people the, the whole mystery of the Blessed Trinity, which we all know is not an easy one to understand. Patrick's breastplate. Remind us what that is. The breastplate of St. Patrick is a prayer that we patricians say every day. Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ within me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, and so on. It's a beautiful prayer. And the centre of the whole prayer is Christ. There'll be um, people listening to this program who are not used to the way Catholics talk and not used to the way Catholic brothers talk either. But when you say something like Christ within me, Christ before me, Christ around me, Christ above me, in one way, that could sound like, you know, sloganeering or gobbledygook or something. What does that mean practically in your behaviour? When I meet people, then I have to treat people the same way that Christ would have treated those people. And, of course, where we take our example from is the gospel and the picture that we paint of Jesus in the gospel. For us as patricians... Christ is meant to be in every single person we meet every day. The parts that I just quoted there are, are the common parts of the, the breastplate, but it comes from a much longer prayer where Patrick himself is said to have bound Christ around him at the beginning of each day. And it's an important part of Celtic spirituality. Celtic spirituality. Now, there's been, a, I suppose, a a rise in interest in recent decades about the Celtic Church, its history. How has that influenced or touched your order and its spirituality? The whole Celtic way of looking at things brings in an idea of 
respect for people, respect for the environment and seeing God within. The language that Patrick would have used would have been God within the storm, God within the sunrise, all those aspects of nature. And that is something that we take on as well. So for us as patricians, it means that with the Celtic background and also the breastplate spirituality, that we have to reverence the earth, reverence all of it as created by God and as a reflection of God and a part of God. What do we know historically about Patrick? What's provable? I think the fact that he existed is, is fair enough, but you know, the French claim him, he's a Gaul, the Welsh claim him, he's Welsh. What do we really know? My understanding is that Patrick was born somewhere in uh, Britain and uh, it was from there that he was taken into slavery in Ireland. He eventually ended up um, escaping and going back to Ireland and becoming a priest. He received some sort of a vision, some sort of a calling to go back to the people of Ireland and uh, evangelise, and that's exactly what he did. He spent his whole life there. Now, we're talking in the 5th century, I think. It's that far back. We're very early. So Roman Britain, parts of it still exist at least, the, the vestige of the culture. Why Patrick so popular in Ireland? Why do you think that happened? What do you know of that rise of popularity over 1,500 years? What I know is that Patrick did a lot of work in Ireland. When I read things in his confessions and stories about his own life, he did a lot of walking around the place, he moved around, he made himself popular, but also made himself unpopular, with the, uh, particularly with the Druids, and had all sorts of confrontations with those people. So he was well known, and um, he's one of the two principal patron saints of, of Ireland, St Patrick being the first and Bridget being the second. So roughly 12 or 1300 years later, Ireland of the late 18th century is a place where the Irish Parliament has been dissolved, the penal laws are in place, and your founder, Daniel Delaney, actually had to leave the place and was smuggled into, into France to train to be a priest. So it was an Ireland that was not a happy place. Very much so. And Delaney came back to Ireland as a priest and later on as a bishop and worked very, very hard in trying to build up the faith of the, uh, the Catholic population there. His biggest area was in um, the whole Eucharistic side of things. The Eucharist for him was most important, and Eucharistic processions were reintroduced into the country, which, as you said, was under the penal laws at that stage, and um, it wasn't a popular decision, but he did it. Now, those penal laws were quite complicated. They meant, you know... Uh, Catholics couldn't enter the legal profession, Catholics couldn't be teachers, Catholics couldn't be a lot of different things, they couldn't own property, there were inheritance things that prevented Catholics from inheriting property. Uh, churches at one point were not permitted to be built, clergy were even arrested at one stage. Delaney came in at the time when things were just starting to settle down. How did he find the populace when he came back? I think he found many, many challenges and people almost um, forgetting about their faith. And that's why he had to work so hard, and that's why he decided, I think, in the first place to found the Patrician Brothers, and he also founded the Brigidine Sisters one year before us. He discovered a population that was largely illiterate, very disorganised through poverty, drunkenness, uh, public unrest, and he almost despaired and wanted to go home, but his own mother begged him to stay. Now, part of his big plan, as I understand it, was you guys, the Patrician Brothers and the Brigidine Sisters, and you were founded, well, I suppose, to be unkind, as cheap labour to teach. Cheap labour is a term that um, I have heard before, actually, and would agree with. In the, uh, the early stages, actually, the first four guys who became Patrician Brothers ended up being more catechists than actual school teachers. Delaney was very, very keen on teaching the people about the faith. So these guys were catechists. They taught catechism, taught religion to young people and to the adults as well. Not unlike Patrick's mission. Spot on. Patrick did exactly the same thing. Young Father Delaney, before he became Bishop Delaney, uh, returned from France to Ireland in 1776, before Australia was settled. And he set up your order in the next 20 years. 
between the foundation of the order and the work in Ireland, how did uh, the patricians end up in Australia? Maitland was our first foundation in 1883. At that stage, the brothers ran, um, over a number of years, a lot of country schools. Maitland, Bathurst, Orange, Wagga, Dubbo, Albury, Goulburn. They were the, the, the ones that readily come to mind. Later on in our history, we came back in to the, the Sydney area and uh, to Holy Cross College at Ryde, which is now 100 and something years old. And then from there to the inner city schools of Sydney, Redfern, Forest Lodge, Mount Carmel. And then after the movement of population to the western suburbs, we also moved. So we established schools in Fairfield, Granville, Liverpool, Blacktown. We, at one stage, and I don't remember the exact year, obtained what we call papal approbation, which meant that we were directly under the Pope and not associated with any particular diocese or any particular bishop. So we were free to move. That's quite a struggle too, though, for orders, because that was a, a fight um, St Mary MacKillop had here about the independence of an order. Bishops don't like feral religious, do they? No, they don't. And uh, <laughs> the patricians suffered at one stage, and we had to move out of Bathurst Orange in, uh, in those days. We, we had to get out. Just to expand on that, these are brothers. Where do brothers fit? I know they're not priests, but what's the idea of a brother or a sister, Brigidine or patrician? A brother or a sister is a consecrated person. We consecrate our lives to God through the vows of chastity, poverty and obedience. In our congregation, and in most cases with the Brigidines as well, most of us would be teachers. And if you look around the various countries where patricians are now, most of our men are teachers. Why brother? I mean, can I ask you personally... You say it's a consecrated man or woman who takes vows like a monk does or a, or a nun does. Why not priesthood, for example? I was asked once if I wanted to be a priest, and I said no. And that's very true. I have never even considered being a priest. I've been happy in the brotherhood. What attracted me in the first place was the, the men who taught me in school. What drew me to them was the relationship that they had with us boys. In the classroom, there was work to be done and the brothers were quite tough, no problems there, but outside the classroom was a totally different ball game. They were friendly, they would talk to whoever, and this is something that drew me towards them and uh, I think is at the basis of my life that I'm in relationship and this is where my primary relationship happens to be. I made the, the cheap labour joke before, but there is a sense in which this is like an alternative economy because the Catholic Church, if it has men and women who are willing to commit their entire lives to something like education, it gives enormous flexibility because it actually does save a lot of money and it also produces very committed people and it means the poor can be taught, doesn't it? It does. When you say the poor can be taught... I think that's been one of the big characteristics of the schools and the areas where we have gone. I was not around when our brothers were in the inner city schools, Redfern, Forest Lodge and uh, Mount Carmel of Waterloo. When I talk to, you meet people who were students at that time, in the time of the Depression, one of the things they say very strongly about the brothers is that the brothers shared the same level of life as everybody else. If the ordinary person struggled, the brothers struggled. If the ordinary person couldn't pay school fees, then there wasn't any problem. The brothers accepted whatever was possible and they lived on whatever they got from the, from the local people. Now that's interesting uh, in that school funding came in after the 60s. The whole nature of uh, education in one sense has changed in that there is a lot of government money that goes into it. Has it, in fact, caused any mission drift in your schools? And by mission drift, I mean, have they ended up middle class after all? I suppose you'd have to say that, yes, some of our clientele would be middle class. That, that would be definitely so. But there are still those who struggle with school fees, who struggle with the ordinary day-to-day -day living. And for some reason... Um, these are the ones who end up in our schools in the areas where we are. 
with the diminishing number of religious anyway in, in the Western church, the church in the developed world, paid teachers have had to come in. And in fact, there aren't as many of you guys now. It must be that the nature of those schools is changing, in fact, inevitably. Religious just could not keep on going. Our numbers have fallen, but the quality of lay teacher that is around now, quality of training, uh, quality of support within Catholic education offices, is really very, very good. It has in some ways changed the nature of particular schools, but we work hard to try and encourage our own charism, our own spirit, to still be in existence within those schools. You mentioned to, the, to me, um, given your position as the 2IC of the worldwide congregation, that um, you're quite big in India, of all places. Now, there are millions and millions of Catholics in India, which constantly surprises me to remember, many more than there are in Australia. What is it that's attracting them, keeping that your order actually relatively healthy in, in terms of numbers? I think what attracts them in the first place is the desire to do some good within their own country. That comes through. Now, having said that, obviously some would join for wrong reasons. There are some who over the past have uh, joined for the purpose of education, getting themselves qualified, and once they're qualified to a certain point, then they leave us. That's one of the chances you take. But generally speaking, we have men who are committed to the poor and who are committed to making a difference in their own country, and I think that's what does it. You're from the developed world, but you can see your order working in various places, and you've spent considerable time in New Guinea. What gets you out of bed in the morning? I'm happy with the life that I lead. I see that I can do something worthwhile. I went back to Papua New Guinea in 2006, and that for me was a, was a real homecoming in many, many ways, and meeting ex-students of mine from the first time I was there, which was 1976, some 30 years before, really made me realise how much of a difference I had been able to make in the lives of some people. I couldn't, really couldn't see myself outside of religious life, but that's what gets me out of bed. I am committed to the life that I lead, I believe I belong here, and I'm happy with the life that I lead. <laughs>